here. Praise God. Holy Spirit's here. But we're going to give our team, uh, the whole team, a, a nice break. So if you're watching, God bless you guys. Get better soon. In Jesus' name, be healed and whole and recover quickly. And for all those joining us online, that's why we're not going to do a worship night or a worship set tonight. I'm, I'm a kind pastor. <laughs> And I'm not going to sing for you. That's how, that's how kind I am. I'm not going to lead. Uh, I tried to talk Sherry into it, but she said no. So anyway, we're going to just open with prayer and uh, do what we normally do, but just skip that first part. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for everybody here tonight. God, we thank you for those that are here that have come together, gathered in your name. And God, we have this promise from Jesus himself who said, if just two or three gather in my name, I'm there in the midst so God, we thank you for the blessing of your spirit. Thank you for needs being met, answers to questions, strength, courage, wisdom, Lord, insight, all coming by your spirit through the word. And we thank you, Lord, for those watching online. The same thing applies to them. Lord, let everyone reach out by faith and just choose to receive at the beginning of this night in Jesus name. Praise God. Amen. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings as we normally do. And... We'll prove that you don't have to have songs leading up to the offering to have a good offering. How about we prove that tonight? Amen. Praise God. Give the, give the best offering ever. How about that? Anyway, anyway, we gave ours already, but if you want to give, that's our website, truenorthchurch.ca. You can click on the Give tab at the top right, and that takes you to our giving page if you want to give by EFT. The email address is give at truenorthchurch.ca. If you need an envelope for your giving, if you raise your hand, we have an usher that will help you out and get one to you right away. But no matter how you give, thank you in advance for your giving. And for those of you online, same applies to you. Praise God. Isn't it good to be givers and be generous? I don't have to talk to you for 20 minutes and twist your arm. Just say what the word says and uh, encourage you. And we are very grateful for that. Praise God. Amen. Father, we bless this offering. We thank you, Father, for your model of giving and generosity. And Lord, as we give back, God, we, we realize, we acknowledge with our tithes and offerings that everything we have uh, comes from your hand and, and the blessing to, to breathe oxygen and be alive and to be blessed and to work and to do things, Lord, that bring in resources. God, we give you praise and, and glory. And we thank you, Lord, our story is not over. But God, each of us has ways, uh, Lord, of believing you and uh, days ahead where we can see our best days uh, by your great hand of provision. We believe you for that. We thank you for it. And you take the limits off our finances and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. All right. We're going to go right to the word because uh, I have nothing else. <laughs> I'm not going to make up announcements for the fun of it. I don't like doing that on a good day, but um, because we don't have we don't have our worship team tonight, we'll just get right to the Word of God. They'll be back in full strength and full health next week. We have a great worship team, aren't we? Blessed, Amen. so blessed. That's why I don't mind giving them a break because uh, uh, they. I told Julie, you, good goodness, you deserve it, um, and uh, she would have pushed through. But it's better that we do this. And we'll, we'll come back around and get that worship night in. Praise God. And as soon as we know what night that is, we'll let you know. Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Proverbs. And I'll tell you the chapter in a moment. Uh, but let me introduce to you a new series. Um, we like to do things in a series because it gives me time to uh, develop a, a topic or a message. A little more than just one week. I like doing one-off messages, but... With a series, you can dive a little deeper and uh, each week pick up where we left off from the previous week. And I think we learn a lot more that way um, when you're part of a church and you're a teacher like I am. I think it helps us all. And so this series is going to be about words and specifically, that's the title, Words to Live By. But uh, the key is there are words we can live by, live being the key word. Your words can help you live a better life. In all kinds of ways. And we're going to go into the word of God and see why that's true. But just think for a moment with me as we kick off this series on words. Think of some of the most important phrases. Maybe most popular phrases 
in the English language uh, that we have, very impactful words. It doesn't take many words to be quite impactful and be words you never forget. Um, here's some. This one's only four words. I can do this. Do you ever hear somebody say, or maybe you had to do that yourself, I can do this. That might be the most important word you say in, or phrase you say in months. I can do this. Or we're going to make it. Good things to say. Um, here's something you could say in, uh, along the same line to encourage somebody else. You got this. Do you ever tell somebody cheering them on? You got this. Well, that's good to hear when you need to hear it. Important words. Um, here's another way, you know, hope you mean it when you say it, but three words, you're the best. Or two words, you're awesome. Or more words where you define exactly what that means. But in other words, to encourage somebody and tell them not just what's in your mind, because nobody knows what's in your mind, but you get the words out and you tell somebody what they mean to you. Well, that's a powerful thing, but words do that. Um, on the other hand, you can say terrible words. Three words, I hate you. Maybe three of the harshest, cruelest, hardest words to hear in the English language. Another, on the flip side, to hear three other words. These are great words to hear. I love you. Powerful words. Some people wait their whole lifetime to hear that from somebody who matters in their life. When you talk to yourself, and all of us do talk to ourselves a little bit, so we might even be found, if we followed you around long enough, we might even hear some of the words as we talk to ourselves under our breath or just let the words escape. And we say things like, I give up, or I never win, or we put ourselves down. Words. And then there's two words when it comes to repair and relationships. We say something like, I'm sorry. Or you're forgiven. Powerful words. Last week and the week before, as we approached Easter and celebrated what Christ did on the cross, how many know he spoke three important words on the cross as he paid the penalty for our sin? Anybody remember? He said, it is finished. Maybe the three greatest words ever uttered by a man. And so we're going to talk about some of these, these scriptures and I found out there's over 400 verses in the Bible that talk about words. So to say, well, it doesn't really matter what I say. God knows what I mean. Everybody knows what I mean. Oh, I don't mean that. And I can say what I want. Or I just say whatever hits. You ever hear this? I just say whatever comes across my mind. You're, or, or somebody, I just give them a piece of my mind. Meaning they spoke some words. But words matter. So let's go to Proverbs 18 and begin there. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. As we approach it, we do so with reverence and respect. God, help every here, online, in person. God, help us to receive what you have for us tonight from your word. Let this be the best Bible study ever. God, let it just shape our lives and, and set us up for what you have for us in the future and all the success you have ordained for us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Proverbs 18, 20 to 21 in the NIV says this, from the fruit of their mouth. A person's stomach is filled. Another way of saying that is the fruit means consequences. From the consequences of a person's mouth, a stomach is filled. With the harvest of their lips, they are satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, usually we quote just verse 21, but 20... With 21 gives even greater context. He's not talking about eating. He's talking about what you say. The words that pass out of your mouth. Over your tongue. He's saying there are consequences to what we say. And he said the tongue. The tongue actually has the power. Has the power. Has the power. Has the power to do things. What does it have, what's it have the power to do Pastor Ron? Well according to the word. It has the power of life and death. And those who learn to use it to their advantage will eat its fruit. Wow. Somebody say wow with me. You're allowed to say wow or amen tonight. Uh, special privilege on nights with no worship team. Or you can just say anything at all. Praise God. It's just make it sound a little fuller in here. Proverbs 18, 20, and 21 in the NCV, the 
New, New Century Version says this, people will be rewarded for what they say. They will be rewarded by how they speak. What you say can mean life or death. Those who speak with care will be rewarded. Now it just makes it even clearer English. There's a reward for those who learn how to talk, learn how to use their words in the right way. We're all going to be using words. We're all going to talk and just say stuff. But apparently, according to God who created us this way, our words can make our life better or worse. And we can actually be rewarded by the words we speak. They mean life or death. So get this straight. If you're taking notes, good night to take notes. Always a good night to take notes. Amen. But words, number one, words can bring about death and decay. If I just say death, you'll think, yeah, death. But if I define death for you, it's kind of gross and disgusting. And it's a place you don't want to go. Death is is not what God planned for us to do. That's why they, That's why humans lived so long in the book of Genesis in the beginning. When God created them, they were closer to God's ideal. His ideal creation was for, for men and women to live hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Do you ever look up Methuselah and how old he was? I think 968 years uh, before the curse settled in and had its full effect, sin and the, the, the curse that came upon um, the human race, um, it brought death. It brought a death cycle. It brought decay. God meant for us to live on forever. That's why we have heaven. That's why we have eternity. Amen. These are just temporary bodies. You understand that, right? But words can actually bring about death. Not just uh, maybe physical death in some, some cases, but really he's talking about death in all kinds of ways. In other words, it can take you back instead of putting you ahead. It can, help, it can make you digress instead of progress. The wrong words can bring a death, the death cycle. If you want to kill a relationship, then learn to talk bad. Or just do it automatically. Well, is my, my grandma talk this way? My grandpa talk this way? This is how we talk in our house. But when you become a Christian, hello. Can I get one amen? But when you become a Christian, you really are obligated under the Lordship of Christ to say, Lord, what you say about my words is more important than what I was taught in my family or my education or just my old dirty flesh habits. I need to talk in a way that brings life, not death, to relationships. So words of doubt, hate, gossip, gossip, criticism, uh, complaining, all these things if they're the wrong kinds of words, they, they bring about death, decay. Your life starts going backwards based on your words. On the other hand, <laughs> praise God there's another hand. But words can also bring life and progress. Not death and decay. I prefer that. Life and progress. Words of faith and love. Words of comfort, encouraging words, celebration words. They bring life. They bring progress. They bring health. They bring healing. They bring wholeness. And I'm not talking about just people's bodies. Could, could be that way in some cases. But in your soul. How many know you're a spirit, soul, and body? You're a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. And God wants all of you to be healthy, all of you to be blessed. And he said, words have a big part in that. Your life, in other words, can go forward based on your words. Instead of going backwards, you go forward. How do I do that, Pastor? And what long, mysterious quest must I, must I be on to, to have a, uh, a progressive Christian life? Well, start with your words. So ask yourself, how are you using your words? I want you to think about that over the next couple weeks. How are you using your words? And if somebody had a calculator, a word calculator, and they just ran around behind you and added up all your words <laughs> in life, well, that'd be an annoying person, wouldn't it? But if somebody just added up all your words over your lifetime, what would your family and fr friends say about your words? What would they say? Well, they were, they spoke a lot of death words, tell you the truth. They spoke, <laughs> there was not many life words. There was not many Believing words, a lot of doubting words, not many encouraging words, a lot of discouraging words. 
um, a lot of mean words, not very many kind words. Some, see, words are being added up. We're, we're speaking words. And sometimes we have to check that and let God convict us of that. And if you're in a really, really good relationship, say with a spouse, maybe they can be honest with you and tell you, honey, how's my words? Or ask a child, <laughs> how do I talk? And if you pray about these things, I believe the Holy Spirit will help you. He'll check you on this himself. So we want to glorify God with our words. And that's what this series is about, learning how to get some word skills. Everyone say word skills. And uh, this, this today is we're going to talk tonight just for a while about why words matter. But then we're going to talk each week for a little bit about godly, Christianly word skills. How to use our words in a way that glorify God, glorifies God and, and progresses our life. And don't think, well, I got this figured out. I know he's going to talk about it. No, you don't because <laughs> there's all kinds of ways words, the right words will help you. And we'll, we'll just cover, we'll cover them as the Lord leads. And uh, hopefully you'll end up discovering what, like we just saw in Proverbs 18, the words, your words have power, have power. Praise God. So why do words matter? Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Words matter because God says they do. Words matter because they matter to God. Words matter because God uses words. And I can prove that. Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 3. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Everyone say the word of God. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. It was created by the word of God. He didn't think it into existence. <laughs> He thought about it, but he said something about it. So that that which was seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now, the, the Latin word for this process that our great and awesome Heavenly Father, our Creator, used here. And, and we put a word on it. We put a name on it. And in Latin, it's called ex nihilo. nihilo and uh, it means to create something out of nothing. There was nothing. And then there was something. So out of nothing came creation. And there's only one who could do that from the beginning. And that was God. I took nothing. There was nothing. And he created it. But he used his words. And you'll see, you'll see why that's so important here in a moment. But God created the universe. He wanted. And he gives us a, a very specific uh, history of what he said and what he did through the book of Genesis that Christians and of course Jews before us could look at and see this is what God did and this is how he did it. And then we learn from him. Now let's look at some of that in Genesis chapter 1, the book of beginnings. Very first book of your Bible, Genesis 1. How he made a visible world with invisible words. Think about it. He, 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 he created something that wasn't there out of words, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. If you didn't know this, the earth existed before this first day of creation. So he did some creating before the creation. This is how vast and awesome God is and infinite he is. How many know he existed before we did? And before everything and anything that is and was, he created so there's a whole backstory there. We don't know the whole backstory. We get glimpses of it in other books of the Bible. But, but this story begins with the earth being form and void darkness on the face of the deep. And it says, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In other words, God was planning to do something. God was about to do something. Hallelujah. Amen. The spirit of God was hovering over something dark and formless. And void, meaning empty. I mean, the earth was a whole lot of nothing. Nobody's like, oh, what a beautiful, wonderful creation. No, there was nothing beautiful. And if you've ever been in that place in your life where you're looking at something like, God, this 
thing I got before me, it's dark and formless and void, it's empty, and it's just like, how in the world, what are we going to do? Well, look back to the Bible and see what did God do? Well, first of all, the Spirit of God was hovering. He was planning. He was thinking. And listen, God's a better thinker than all of us put together. Amen. You know, and, and uh, it's important to know what he did next. And God said, verse 3, say that with me. And God said, say that again. And God said, he didn't just sit and think about it. He didn't just ponder it. He didn't just plan it and meditate and like we do sometimes. And I know we're trying hard to think in human terms about God here. Very difficult. But that's what we do sometimes is we think and ponder and wonder and wish and imagine and no words come out. But God did something very different. He said, let there be light. Three words, no, four words. Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. And verse five, another interesting two words. He says, it says, the, the scripture says, God called. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. If you go through all of creation, all six days of creation, you see God wanting something and calling something. Wanting something and making it. And every time he did, there were words involved. Are you getting a clue on how God operates? He didn't just sit and, boy, it'd sure be nice if this world was fixed. If this world was, boy, wouldn't a creation. No, he didn't do that. He said, he called. So what we see here is God called for what he wanted. He didn't state, he didn't simply state the way that things were. Now I want to be clear and I'll bring this point back around at the end of the message. I am in no way remotely saying we are God. God's sovereign in his universe. He alone is God. And it's a good day when you realize there is a God and you're not him. <laughs> Amen. But you also need to follow it up with another good theological truth, which is God created us in his image and likeness. And so we would be smart, wise, behooved to learn from God who created us to operate and function uh, at a level, uh, let's just say slightly above the animals, <laughs> uh, above just, you know, just our base nature. He wants us and, and uh, actually prefers that we walk like him, that we think like him, that we learn from him. Amen. You see that all through the Bible. And Jesus bears that out of the New Testament as well. We, we don't see how far, how radical. That's the problem in the world today. People want to say, how far can I get from God's laws and God's principles and his morals and his ideas? I just want to do my own thing. Yeah, it never goes well when we do our own thing. But Christians should watch and learn and read and then follow God. So one thing God didn't do is simply state the way things were. Boy, it sure is dark. It sure is it sure is missing something here. He called, he said, he spoke. So the first words ever spoken were the powerful words of God. And again, we're not saying your words are just as powerful as God. That'd be ridiculous. But our words do hold power. Death and life are in the what? Power of the tongue. So because we are created in his image and likeness, there is something about how we speak that matters. And if you ignore that through your life, you'll, you'll reap the fruit of it. Like those two verses in Proverbs say, you'll, you'll bear the consequences of it. Ah, it doesn't matter what I say. No, God created you to operate on a higher level. Your words can create some stuff. Not on a God level, but you can prophesy about your future. You can predict things. You can put people down enough to where they believe it. You can put yourself down enough with your own words. You believe it. Hello? So in Genesis 1, there was nothing. And then in the Latin, ex nihilo, God spoke life. <laughs> Let there be light. And there was, praise God. So as humans, we have the gift and responsibility of speaking. We were created differently than any other life form on earth. I really, really love my dog, but he is not on our level. I just want to tell you, he confirms it every day. He's never spoke to me. He can bark, but... 
I can't even figure out what the barks mean sometimes, tell you the truth. But God, God made us to speak for a reason. Not just so we can state the obvious. Oh, my life sucks. Or, oh, this is terrible. This is going to go from bad to worse. He wants us to direct our life. And as Christians prophesy good things, point our life in the right direction using the power of our words. Amen. So as humans, we have this. Uh, and God made us this way. We're not taking something from God. He gave it to us. Um, Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at this a little more in detail. The creation of man and women. Uh, men and women. Uh, man and woman first, then others after. But Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And God said. And God said. Here he goes again. And God said. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion. Over the fish of the sea. And over the birds of the Heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said to them. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Those two phrases together. And God blessed them. And God blessed them. And God said to them. And God. Yes, that's right. All right, you know, ma'am, ma'am, I'm, I'm going to teach, okay? Thank you, but, and I agree, but we're going to go ahead with the message. I, I agree. Okay, but can we, can I talk? Thank you. So God puts these. Phrases in here for us to look back and remember. Here's what he says. And God blessed them. And God said to them. God's blessing is connected to what he said. Again, words. But we're created in the image of God. We're created in his likeness. And then he says something here you might miss. You've, I'm sure you've probably read this a lot of times. But he said, let them have dominion. So he didn't want us to just act like, well, I just... I just, I'm just the lowest form on the earth. I'm just, the, I'm just no better than the animals. I'm just no better than creation. And, and uh, you know, I could say a lot, but I won't. You know, the people that think just everything matters more than humans. No, humans are God's prize, prize creation. No one else, nothing else is created in his image and likeness. And told to have dominion. Hallelujah. I just thought he created us to have a terrible, horrible, no good, wicked top. No, dominion. If you're not sure what that word means, think of victory. Think of winning. Thinking of, think of progress, success, things going right, not going wrong. So then what did he do? After he said these things, he said, be fruitful. In verse uh, 28 again, God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then, now get this, then Adam began to name the animals. Go down to Genesis chapter 2. So God sets in order, I want, my, I want my man to do this. I want these humans to have this authority. I've wired them, it's in their DNA and then this is exactly what happened in Genesis 2, verse 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and the birds in the sky. And he brought them to the man. Now get this. To see what he would name them. See, God gave them dominion. And then he brought the animals. He gave them responsibility. And then he says, I love this account. He says, oh, well, let's just see what he names them. So God didn't micromanage and say, Adam, you have no clue how to manage. Get out of the way. Let me do this because you're going to screw it up. No, he said, I'm giving you, you're in my image and likeness. I'm teaching you how to call, how to say about words. And now I'm going to give you some animals. Now you get to name them. You know what? He's still giving that privilege and that right to people today, especially to those who come through the blood of Christ and into a new covenant with God through Jesus Christ. And they're now in relationship. They're not at a distance. They're not far from God. They're now close. Amen. You can't get any closer than family. So put yourself in here. And you see that God is still wanting us 
in covenant with him, his children. He's still, in, he's still waiting to see what we name things, what we call things. And so it says, he brought the animals to see what he would name them. And, and get this, continue in verse 19. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Well, hold on a minute. God's in God's sovereign overall. It'd be God's name. No, but of course he's still sovereign. But sovereign God made a man that was not sovereign. And he gave him delegated authority and said, I, I, I'm giving you dominion. And I'm going to let you name some things and call things. So uh, you could say it like this. You know, fathers, you've done this with your sons. If you have a son or daughter, you say, son or daughter, you know, watch how I do this. Okay. All right. Watch it. You get it? All right. Now I'm going to step back and now you do it. (laughs) And so he says to Adam, all right, now you do it. And whatever Adam named, that was the name. Where did he learn that from? Well, God. So verse 20, so the man gave names to the livestock, all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And of course, then God created Eve out of his side. Praise God. Adam's best day ever. And it went kind of downhill from there. But anyway, that was a good, good day when he got to help me. Praise God. Good to find a help me. Um, but, but interesting how, you know, people think, well, you know, you just can't say things. You just can't, in a Christian sense, you know, it's so audacious, so bold and brash and crazy. How can you just say, how can you just call for what you want? You just need to be in reality as a Christian and just say what there is. Just if the dark skies are dark, then call them dark skies and nothing beyond that. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, there's something in us if we listen to the Spirit of God. The same spirit that hovered over the deep and he's going to call you. He's going to beckon you to say something different than everyone else is saying. When the dark skies are dark, you say, hey, what, what the real deal is, there's a sun behind those clouds. Hallelujah. The sun will shine again. It's not all gone. Amen. I know the God who created the sun and the, and the, and the clouds. And uh, on and on it goes like that. So taking dominion still involves naming and calling. And here's a good question to ask yourself. Do you bless anything in your life? And, and it's an honest question uh, because there's times in my life where I forgot how to do this. I, you ever learn a skill and then kind of forget? <laughs> it's not everything's like riding a bike. Sometimes you just forget. You let things slip, especially truths. Amen? Uh, how many remember algebra perfectly from... Eighth grade. Yeah, right. And I think there's spiritual principles we can learn about the power of words. And we, we, we've been taught it in times past. Maybe, maybe not. And, and then we, we just let it slip like, well, it doesn't matter. No, it still matters because it's still in the Bible. Your words direct your life. Your, your life will go in the direction of your words. Because your tongue still has the power of life and death. And it's one way. We secure dominion. It's one way we act like God. Can't be God. You're not even remotely like God. But his spirit does live in you. And you are in relationship with him as a child to a father. Hallelujah. So you ought to strive to act like him and learn from him. And that means you need to bless some things in your life. That's a good question to ask yourself. Do I bless anything? Do I bless anything in my life or do I just state the obvious? Now, it's okay to do a combination, you know, because otherwise you might be denying uh, something that needs to be acknowledged. Yeah, I was wrong. Boy, I messed that up. I made the wrong turn. I should have listened to my wife and got directions. I did that, you know, I, I, I messed up. But, <laughs> I'm going to add a conjunction. But, glory to God. God showed me the way. And it's going to get better from here. God, God corrected me and he showed me what to do. Or uh, I asked forgiveness and now that's under the blood and that's behind me. And now I'm going on. Praise God. It got worse, but now it's going to get better in Jesus name. I have some needs, but praise God, I found out he meets all my needs. So it's not like we live in denial. That's not what, what Christians do, but. 
if we state the obvious, we know how to follow it up and say, well, I know there's more to the story. I'm going to call for blessing. I'm going to call some things blessed in my life, not just cursed. And I want to tell you, it's the natural, um, it's the natural position, the natural mindset of all of us before Christ as part of a broken, sinful world to curse things. Think about it. We live in a cursed world, broken by sin and, and the curse. Um, but that wasn't God's plan. So he redeems us to take the sting of that curse away. Amen. But, but it takes work because it's easy. Before Christ, you cursed everything. That's why it's so natural. If you said in probably any language of the world, um, what are your curse words? Everybody could tell you. Oh, yeah, well, here's something. They just go down to the local playground. They will hear a bunch of curse words. Because from a young age, people just learn curse, 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 curse my life, curse this person, curse this situation, curse my boss, curse my finances, curse my checkbook, curse. It's so natural, isn't it? You act like you've never heard of this before. <laughs> you're looking at me. No, I think you're thinking. Amen. I'm going to think better. I mean, it's awkward to talk about, but think about how common and easy it is in, in a curse world to just curse things. And, and even when we know better, we can do this and let it slip when we get anxious or stressed or upset or angry or somebody cuts us off in traffic. It's funny how the thing that wants to sneak out, that wants to come out, is not a blessing like, I'm going to pray for you, bless you, thank you, glory to God. Your best days are ahead of you. Now we think of other things. That's our disposition. And so think about in your life, do you, do you spend any time developing that skill of blessing? Or, or is it just kind of the natural default? You, you go to, you curse some and maybe curse a lot. And I want to direct you back to the word of God and show you it doesn't have to be that way. God created you to take dominion and bless and use your words, the power of your tongue, to allow good things to happen. Word management, everyone say word management. Word management is vital. So vital. It, it brings us closer to our blessing instead of further away. If you're somebody who just curses a lot, you're getting just further away from blessing because now you've, you just got good at cursing. And it's a learned activity for sure. But you can reverse that and learn how to bless. That's what this is about. Next week, we're going to talk about how to develop the skill of using words to bless somebody else. And for some of you, that might be easy and you already do it. And uh, it's still going to bless you. It's going to help you. But some people, it's like, why would I do that? I don't do that. I, here's what I do. I call people out. <laughs> I tell them what I think. I am a professional critic. You show me a person, I'll show you their faults and what they're doing wrong. And I'm happy to tell them, you know, amen. That's rough. But God doesn't want Christians to be that way. But it's, it's learned. You can reverse that and, and learn how God wants you to treat others. Um, word management is so vital. It also enriches the lives of those around you. When, when you learn how to manage your words as a Christian, you become a greater blessing to everybody around you. If you're married, guess what? They get the first benefit. They get blessed the most. If you have children, oh my goodness, they're going to get blessed. You have parents, they're going to get blessed. If you have friends, if you have a, uh, friends, uh, my goodness, isn't it great to be around somebody who's an encourager instead of a professional discourager? Amen. Well, God will help you do that. In fact, that's what he wants all of us to be like. And uh, words are just so, word management is so vital. If you steward your words well, it ends up that God can strategically use you in ways you never dreamed. He'll He'll plant you and place you in places where he can use you and your words because he can count on you to say the right thing at the right time. And Proverbs has a lot to say about people that know how to say words, uh, the right word at the right time. <laughs>
But can God count on all of us to do that? No, I think strategically, some of us have put ourselves, uh, made ourselves, if you could say this, unusable by God. Because if God put us into situations where somebody was hurting or needful, we'd just make it worse. We'd screw it up because we just, we're just looking for an angle. How can I? Well, I see somebody's weak and wounded. Let me hurt them more. Let me take out their knees. You know, some people are that broken. And God wants us to all be healed and whole. Amen? And then use our words to be a blessing to others. So you can get so good at your word management where he can put you in places where you're needed. And say, I got the right, oh, I got somebody, oh, I need them to meet up with this person because if I put them there, if I put them anywhere in the near vicinity, you know, wow, they're going to they're gonna say something and build them up, encourage them. And this person needs it. But if, you've, if you're a Christian who's never developed that, these are really, this is not deep. This is really the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? If you look at the nine fruits of the Spirit in the, the epistle of Galatians, you'll see some of the things that words ought to be filled with. Hallelujah. But you can become someone God says, I'll put them. <laughs> if I put them in this relationship, if I take this person, if I put these two together, praise God, this, this person's going to be helped because they're an encourager. It makes you usable. Hmm. If you're given the opportunity, do you bless people? Do you, as John Maxwell says, do you add value to their life or do you try and take some away? Is there, instead of, instead of, I'm getting into next week, but instead of a negative vibe going on and negative words, do you find a way to bless them? Your tongue has power. And words really, really matter. And until you believe that, you won't bother learning any of these skills. You'll just think, ah, I understand. I don't want that. Words don't matter. Words. Sticks and stones. My hair, my... Yeah, that doesn't work either. <laughs> That's not true. Words Words do make a difference. And once you believe that, and simply believe Proverbs 18, 20, and 21, then God can go to work on you. God can teach you a whole new language. And you'll go to say something, oh, ah, you'll catch yourself. Ah, can I rewind that? Blah, blah, blah. Can I rewind it? Can I take that back? Or you'll say something uh, like we all have, and then you'll take it back. And say, ah, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I might have meant it, but I was stupid. I'm going to say something better now and correct it. Here's what I really mean. Amen. Praise God. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You know, personally, um, you know, there's certain activities we, we might have in life where we wouldn't hang out with somebody or spend quality time with, pers with people who were dangerous or they had something very powerful and they didn't respect it. They say this, I'm not, I haven't ridden motorcycles in a very long time, but they say that uh, the day you stop fearing that, that motorcycle, that Harley or whatever it is you're driving, then you should put the keys away because there has to be a respect for it. If you handle uh, firearms at the shooting range, you know, you don't ever want to go to the range with somebody who doesn't respect the power of that thing. And they're just flippant and careless. I'm not going with you, buddy. Sorry, <laughs> pick somebody up. I'm not going to hunt with you. I'm not going to shoot with you. Because there's some power there. And it can be deadly power. If somebody's careless with it. And, and, and here's the word God uses regarding our tongue. He says, there's power in your tongue. Can I talk you into using it for good, for life? And not death. So that you're not blowing up your life, your future. Or, or somebody else's. I was with a, uh, a dad many, many, many years ago. And I was talking to their uh, it was his, his, his uh, I'll just say his relative was right there with him. And uh, that was his son. And uh, he was talking and, you know, I'm thinking, you know, oh, he's going to say something really great about his son with, with the pastor. And it was, it was a charming moment. And then all of a sudden he started taking apart his son and saying all the things his son was doing wrong and what he didn't like uh, that he was doing, what he needed to correct. And like, listen, everybody has things they need to work on and correct. Amen. I don't care how old you are, <laughs> father, whether you're father or son, 
But out of all the things in the English language that could be chosen in front of somebody else, and I could see the son, just his face, just demoralized. And a little bit of that death, that decay just started. So now he's realizing, probably already knew, but I don't have very good standing with my dad, but also now with this pastor and yeah, I'm an idiot. Words matter. But on the other hand, have you ever been in a, a locker room halftime and the coach is giving one of those, those speeches and they're cheering you up and they're, they're stirring you up and they're encouraging you? And God says, you know what? You, you can all be, in, in one way or another, a coach for somebody else. You can be an encourager. You can use your words to coach yourself out of some tough things and speak life. And, and if you develop this enough, I can use you as a coach to help somebody else and speak life into their, into their lives. Amen. One more time. Proverbs 18. People will be rewarded for what they say. They will be rewarded by how they speak. What you say can mean life or death. Those you speak with care. Those who speak with care will be rewarded. Hallelujah. Those who speak with care will be rewarded. Now, I'm going to answer this question, like I said at the beginning. Are words at all that matter? Because, Pastor Andy, you've, you, you've taught about words all night. Now, does that mean the words, if I just say anything, it'll happen? No, I'm not saying that. We're, we're not talking magic. <laughs> There are things that have to be combined with words. If you read the, the rest of scripture, and we'll, we'll cover probably some of it. Mark 11, Jesus talked about the power of words, but he joined it with faith. He said, you need faith in your heart. And also when it comes to asking God for big things, like say a mountain being moved, you combine your words with faith in your heart. So I can't give you a list if they just say this enough times and it'll happen. Well, I don't know if it'll happen because I don't know if there's faith in your heart. I don't have a spiritual faith x-ray machine I can slide up and I don't know between you and God. And there's always other factors. <laughs> I mean, know in life there's always other factors. Somebody's mountain could be the size of the anthill in the backyard like we had when I was a kid and you'd mess with. And somebody else's mountain could be like, oh, Mount Everest, like a real mountain. But words matter when combined with faith. So faith has a factor when it comes to asking God for big things. Also, Jesus said this about words. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there's something about your heart getting engaged. Well, I'm just going to say a bunch of stuff. Well, okay, we'll start there. That's not a terrible place to start. But you need to end up in your heart. You need to end up making sure things are real and things are legitimate. Um, we know this truth about all of us in human nature, whether we're Christians or no. If you say something long enough, you start believing it. Let me say it again. If you say something long enough, you start believing it. There's something about the words we speak out of our own mouth. They seem more valid, more. And, and you know, people that are, this is terrible, but people that are really good liars, which is always a bad thing, how many agree? But it's bad to be, don't be a liar. Speak the truth all the time. But good, good liars are those who have said something long enough. They really believe it. And that person's really deceived, but it's the most frustrating person to deal with if they really believe what they say and what they speak is totally untrue. So it matters what we say. And if we put ourselves down or somebody else long enough and continuously enough, we'll start believing that even if it's completely contrary to the will of God, to the promises of God. And God's like, that's not what I said. That's not what I want for you. That's not what I, I don't want you. Where did you get that? And we just keep saying it and saying it. And there's a story I heard from a, a, a man I worked for many, many years ago. And he was a, he was a, an older guy then, but he said when he was a kid, they did, you know, boy, how many know boys invent games that probably they shouldn't have, but they do things. And uh, back in the day, you could get away with all kinds of... Anyone remember cap guns and BB guns? And seems like I have a theme going tonight. But anyway, oh, you can have so much fun with those. But anyway, he was telling the story. And I had a BB gun. It was a blast. But I lived in the country. And, 
and, and uh, it, it didn't matter. But and we were taught safety safety rules with with our BB guns. But this guy, an older guy, he told this hilarious story of how when he was young, um, he was way older than me, but he said. Um, we didn't have the BB guns, but we would just get those tubes of BBs that were cheap at the hardware store and we'd put a whole bunch in our mouth. We'd just put them in our mouth and then we'd run around the neighborhood and we'd have like a BB war and spit them at each other. And he said, we got so good. There's little kids. Now, like I said, boys, girls would never do this. <laughs> you don't know what boys are doing. They get, they get some time on their hands, but they're spitting them. He says, you could get so good that they would come out like a machine gun, like continuous, like a whole bunch of BBs. And then you shoot them further and faster. And, uh, and he says, it was gross because, you know, you're spitting and you're, you know, they get the BB and everything else. And, uh. But he said, one time we're playing this game, we're doing this, we're laughing. And, and then my friend came up to me and I had my, my mouth full of BBs and he just hit me hard on the back. And I swallowed every one of them. And I had a stomach full of BBs for a while. And then he made this point, and then I got it. He says, if you have something in your mouth long enough, you'll eventually swallow it. And, th and that's what's true about words. Whether you think, well, this couldn't happen. If you say something long enough, if it's in your mouth long enough, if it's in the mouth of your husband, your wife, and your kids, and everybody in your friend circle, and your coworkers, this is all you talk about. You just say it, say it, say it, say it, say it. There's something in your spiritual DNA that goes way back to your father God who created you in his image and likeness to take dominion. And if you pervert that and say, I can have what I say, but it's all garbage. It's all curse stuff. It's all death stuff. Some of that stuff, you're going to believe it. And even if it's contrary to God, even if it's contrary to his blessing for your life and his promises, you'll believe it. And it will be very hard for someone to persuade you otherwise. Folks, words matter. Amen? Amen. Do you see that? You can't talk death and expect life. You can't talk defeat and expect victory. Death will win. Why? Because your words have the power. And then just fill in the blanks. You, you, you can't talk blank and expect to have blank. I don't know what's going on in your life. You can't talk blank and expect to have blank. Somewhere in your life, you have to pause and analyze and say, wait a minute, I, I need to manage my words because I'm talking. I'm directing my life towards something with my words I don't even want. I'm just looking around at what I have instead of saying what I want. This is not what God did in Genesis 1. This is not what he created me to do. Just sit around and complain and state the obvious. We all know the obvious. We all state the obvious sometimes. But we need to be quick to recover and say what God wants us to have. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word <laughs> that talks to us about our words. Thank you for what we have in your uh, Genesis account, Lord, where we know what you did and how you created the heavens and the earth and even mankind. And, and God, we, we notice those details now. God, you created something out of nothing. You used your words to bring it to pass. God, we realize you're God, we're not. But God, you, t you, you want us to learn from you. You teach us and you instruct us because we have the ability to take dominion or lose it. Through the power of our words. God, help us to be wise. Help us to be careful. Help us, Lord, to use caution. How we speak over ourselves, our life, our stuff. Because I believe like, just like you were with Adam, you're waiting to see what we call things. You're waiting to see what we name things. And you don't step in and stop us. Lord, you've, you've given, you've delegated some authority. God, I pray we use it well. And we use our words to bless our lives to obey you, to follow you, to bless other people. And we ask you for help in this in the weeks ahead. In Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said, amen. Praise God. So go out and name some animals this week. Name, <laughs> name some stuff. Call some stuff. Praise God. And uh, be a blessing to other people. We'll meet back next weekend and, and uh, we'll have a full worship service. Praise God.
All right, let's all stand up. God bless. Let me bless you before you go. May the Lord bless and keep all of you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Praise God. Say hi to somebody on your way out, but have the best week ever, and we'll see you next week.